Gather round. Gather round, boys and girls, sisters and brothers. As many of you know, for many years now I have been living in the distant land of Sweden. Although, myself, hark back from the lands of Yorkshire in the north of England. And today is a prestigious day. I would like to share something rather special with you, in honour of the land that has become my new home. I would like to tell you a few epic sagas of dragon-slaying heroes and giant-smashing gods. These sagas that used to spur on the Viking warriors of old. Yes, awe-inspiring myths from the Viking Age. We will meet Thor, the Thunder God, and Loki, the shape-shifting trickster, as well as sea serpents, fire demons, and frost giants. <laughs> So make yourself comfortable by the fire. Pour up another flagon of mead. Or let these tales follow you on adventures of your own. The Norse myths, as they are called, are the stories told by the Norsemen, often known as Vikings, who lived over a thousand years ago in lands to the far north. Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and Iceland. During long winter nights, they shared stories that fired their imaginations and their fighting spirit. The myths are set in nine magical realms, bound together by a mighty ash tree, Yggdrasil. Humans lived in a place named Midgard, but within the eight other realms dwelt gods and goddesses, giants and dwarves, dragons, and many other amazing, monstrous creatures. But firstly, there are a number of characters and realms that you must be aware of. Most importantly of all, Asgard, realm of the warrior gods known as the Aesir. The main Aesir gods are Odin, king of Asgard and father of many gods, known as the Allfather. The son of Bor, he has three brothers, Fili, Ve, and Honir. Next, Frigg, queen of Asgard. Goddess of marriage and motherhood, she is known for her kindness. And Thor, the thunder god, son of Odin, he loves fighting, feasting, and drinking. And then, Loki, a child of giants who lives in Asgard and has godlike status. He loves adventures, mischief, and trickery. And then the realm of Vanaheim, realm of the Vanir, the fertility gods. The main Vanir gods are Njord, king of Vanaheim, god of the sea. He is noble, wise, and stubborn. And Frey, son of Njord, and god of fertility and plenty. And then Freya, daughter of Njord, and goddess of love and beauty. Also, Jot, 
Jotunheim, the rocky mountainous realm of the giants. And there are two races of giants. The frost giants, huge creatures made entirely of ice. Most are brutal and violent and hate the gods. And then the stone giants, who are incredibly strong and tough. Often short-tempered, they are quick to fight. Then Nida Velia, the realm of the dwarves, who live underground in caves and potholes. Dwarves are short and stubborn. Many are skilled craftsmen who love gold and precious jewels. Also, Niflheim and Helheim, the realms of the dead. Evil men pass through Helheim to die again in Niflheim, a gloomy place of ice, snow, and eternal darkness. Helheim is ruled over by Hell. A gruesome queen, half young and beautiful, half old and rotten. Hell is the daughter of Loki. And Muspelheim, a burning hot realm of fire. Anyone who does not belong to this realm cannot endure the heat. Muspelheim is ruled over by Surt, an evil demon. He has a flaming sword and waits for his chance to burn down the entire world. There is also the realm of Alfheim, home to the Light Elves, but this is barely mentioned in the surviving myths. In the beginning, before the world existed, there was only a place of fire, a place of ice, and a great gap between them. There was no earth, and no sky, no people or living creatures of any kind. But sometimes a wind stirred up, blowing tongues of flame across the gap. The fire licked the edges of the ice and formed the very first living thing, an evil frost giant named Emir. Emir was colossal. When he took his first step, his leg reached all the way across the great gap into Muspelhelm, the realm of fire. He screamed in pain as his toes began to melt and hurled himself back into Niflheim, realm of ice. But it was too late. Great globs of water dripped down from his feet and fell to the ground. There, they formed into a race of smaller giants. Giants of frost and giants of stone. As Eomir began to carve new toes for himself, a gush of fiery wind blew past, scorching yet more of the land of ice. And out of the thaw came another living creature. A huge cow named Ordumla. Rivers of milk flowed from her udders, and Ymir drank from them. In turn, Ordumla licked at the salty ice of Niflheim, and as she licked, a man-like shape began to appear. First his hair, then his head, and by the third day she had licked him free from the ice. She named him Burry. He was big and strong and beautiful. What? 
kind of creature are you? Emir asked, peering down at him. He poked Burry with the tip of his finger and shuddered. Burry's flesh was warm to the touch. You don't belong here, flesh thing, he roared. He kicked Burry, sending him flying into the great gap. But as Burry fell, a giantess reached out and grabbed him. You will be my mate, she said. Burry and the giantess had a son, Boar. In turn, Boar married and had three sons, Odin, Vili, and Ve. You are the first gods, declared Boar, and will be known as the Aesir. One day you will rule this realm and all others. As time passed, Odin and his brothers grew to hate Eomir and his unruly, brutal gang of giants. Eventually they attacked Eomir and killed him, before throwing his body into the Great Gap. Icy blood gushed out of Eomir's wounds, drowning the race of giants. Only two escaped, in a wooden boat riding the rivers of blood. Odin, Feely, and Ve began to make the world from Eomir's remains. His bones and his teeth became mountains and rocks, and his body became the earth. From Eomir's blood they made inland lakes and a vast rocking sea, which they ringed around the world. The gods raised Ymir's skull and made the sky from it. They tossed his brains into the air to make every kind of cloud. Then the three gods took sparks of fire from Muspelheim and flung them high in the sky to be the sun, moon, and stars. Next, the gods began to divide up the land. To the race of giants, thriving once more, the gods gave the rocky ocean coasts and named this realm Jotunheim. The vast inland earth was named Midgard, or Middle Earth. The gods made trees from Ymir's hair and a huge wall from his eyebrows, which they circled around Midgard, to protect it from the raging giants. One day, when walking by the sea, the gods found two trees, an ash and an elm, and from these trees the gods created the first people. Odin breathed life into them, Vili gave them the power to think and feel, and they opened their eyes and mouths. They clothed them and gave them names. The Ash became the first man, Ask, and the Elm became the first woman, Embla. And the gods gave the first people Midgard as their home, for them and their descendants. Midgard was green and warm. There was wind, too, for sailing ships and to stir fire. The wind was created by a giant eagle. When he flapped his vast wings, the wind blew out in great gusts across the earth. In Jotunheim, a giant had a daughter called Night. He was dark-eyed and dark-haired. She had a son, Day, who was radiant and fair. 
Odin took night and day and gave them each a chariot and a horse. He set them in the sky to ride across the world. Night rode first, covering the world in darkness. And day rode behind her, his horse's shining mane lighting up the sky. Down on Midgard, a man named Mundelfari had two children, whom he thought so beautiful he named them Sun and Moon. My children shine with such luminous brightness, he proclaimed. They are surely more dazzling than the gods themselves. How dare you, roared Odin. No human can rival the gods for beauty. As punishment, I will take your children away. Odin whisked them up into the sky and gave them each a chariot too. One chariot held the sun, the other the moon. Snapping and growling at their heels were two fearsome wolves who chased the chariots in a never-ending race across the skies. After this, the gods remembered that there had been maggots crawling in Ymir's body. They turned these into dwarves, small, stocky, human-like creatures, and sent them to live in a realm north of Midgard, called Nida Velia. Here the dwarves made their homes in darkness, in underground caverns, rocky hillsides, and dank grottos. Now, the gods had made the first man and woman, and set night and day and sun and moon in the sky. They had created new realms and filled them with men and with giants and dwarves, and they had surrounded these lands with sea. It was time to make their own realm. They called it Asgard, and they made it beautiful and strong, with shining palaces and fertile lands protected by towering walls. A goddess, Frigg, blessed with the power of prophecy, became Odin's wife. Their son, Balder, was the noblest of all the gods. Odin went on to father more gods, including Thor, God of Thunder, Tyr, God of War, and Vida, God of Vengeance. And he took the name Allfather for himself. From Asgard to Midgard, they built a flaming rainbow bridge and named it Bifrost. They made it with skill and cunning, and they made it strong. And all around, all the realms of the world, grew a giant tree, Yggdrasil, the world tree. It soared over everything. Its leaves dripped dew. And it was forever green. Odin, all father of the gods, longed to learn the secrets of all the realms. He knew that Yggdrasil, the world tree, had three mighty roots. The first drank from the well of Erd in Asgard itself, and was tended by the Norns, women who controlled the destiny of all living things. 
Odin decided to climb down the second route, following it deep into the mountains of Jotunheim, realm of the giants. Here, Yggdrasil's route led to a well, guarded by a gnarled, ugly god named Mimir. Let me drink from your well, Odin called out. No, said Mimir. This water isn't for me to share. It holds the secrets of the universe itself. I am the Allfather, cried Odin. I demand a drink. What can you possibly give me in return? My eyes have seen many wondrous things. I will give you one of them. Mimir agreed, and watched as Odin plucked out one eye and placed it in a cup. Odin drank from the well and learned many secrets, but the water also made him thirsty for more knowledge. He followed the third and deepest of Yggdrasil's roots. Down, down he went, seeing nothing and no one, until a squirrel scampered past him. Little squirrel, called Odin, what lies below? Niflheim, replied the squirrel, the realm of ice, where the wicked go when they die. <laughs> it laughed at him. Didn't you know that? And they call you first of the Asir, <laughs> the wisest god of all. Odin grabbed the squirrel by its tail. You dare to taunt me, impudent creature? Just who do you think you are? I am Ratakost. Be careful before you threaten me, one-eyed Odin. I have friends everywhere, from the giant eagle who nests at the top of Yggdrasil to the dragon Needhog who sits at the very bottom. Reluctantly, Odin released his grip, and the squirrel raced away. Odin journeyed deeper and deeper, until a cold wind whipped around him. Odin clung tightly to the icy root. Go back, shouted a voice from the depths. Odin squinted into the wind with his remaining eye, but he could see no one. Show yourself, he called into the darkness. Turn back, came the voice again. You must return to the land. Of the living. I am Odin, shouted the god, and I go where I please. Now show yourself. But the wind grew stronger and louder, roaring in Odin's ears. This is the land of the dead. And you are not welcome here, said the voice on the wind, and a whole chorus of voices chanted, Go back, go back, go back. Odin was too stubborn to move, but the wind was relentless. At last he stopped fighting and began the long climb back to Asgard. 
but he was not giving up. If Niflheim was the land of the dead, then to discover its secrets, he himself would have to die. Up in the hills of Asgard, Odin stood beside Yggdrasil's wide trunk. He grabbed a spear and thrust it up through his body and into the tree. For eight days and nights, he hung from the spear, his spirit deep in the realm of the dead. There, he discovered the secrets of reading and writing runes and the workings of magic. On the ninth day, Odin came back to life. But still he wanted to know more. He built a throne in Yggdrasil's upper branches, from where he could survey all the realms. Now he could see to the edges of the world, but he wanted to hear too. So he sent out two ravens, who returned each evening to perch on his shoulders and whisper into his ears everything they had heard. And at last, Odin truly was the All-Father, Lord of Gods and Men. The Aesir were not the only gods. A mysterious race known as the Vanir had appeared to the east of Asgard, in the lofty realm of Vanaheim. At first, the gods lived alongside each other in peace, until one day, a mischievous Vanir goddess paid a visit to Asgard. My name is Gullveig, she told the Aesir, and began to delight them with her magic. She conjured fire out of thin air, painting beautiful shapes with the flames and turning them into gold. Then she told the gods what they would do the next day. Each god was amazed when all her predictions came true. Odin was fascinated. I know the secret of runes, he boasted, and I have learned much of the art of magic. But even with all my skill, I can't think how you perform these tricks. I demand to know the secret. Dolveig laughed. <laughs> Why, there is no secret. These tricks are child's play to the veneer. It comes naturally to us. Teach me, then, insisted Odin. But you are an Aesir, a warrior god, came the reply. Your kind revels in violence. We Vanir are gods of the earth. We care for the plants and make them grow. We're so Different. I couldn't teach you if I tried. Odin shook with rage. He couldn't bear the idea of not knowing something. Take this witch and burn her, he shouted. The Aesir tied Gullveig to a wooden stake and lit a fire beneath her. Gullveig laughed even as her body was consumed by flames. Soon she was no more than a heap of ash on the ground. Moments later, a wind blew up. The ash swirled in the air and took on the shape of a woman. The Aesir watched, astonished, as Gullveig's body reformed, 
skin, hair, clothes, and all. Burn her again, roared Odin. But again, Dolveig disintegrated, only to reform as soon as the fire burned out. She laughed maniacally. The Aesir threw spears into Gulveig and burned her body a third time. But she would not stay dead. In the end, Odin worked some magic of his own. Realising he could not kill the Vanir sorceress, he banished her forever, casting her down into a damp and dreary corner of Midgard. Njord, king of the Vanir and god of the wind and waves, was furious. He gathered an army of Vanir warriors, and they thundered to the great wall of Asgard, eager for revenge. The wall was high enough to keep out the tallest of giants, but it could not withstand the Vanir's magic. A powerful spell crumbled the stones, and Asgard lay open to attack. The Vanir marched with weapons raised, ready to meet the Aesir army. But instead, they were met by a single god, Odin himself. Have you come to fight us alone, arrogant Odin? asked Njord. Or are you here to offer your surrender? Why should I surrender? snorted Odin. My son's army has already invaded Vanaheim. You're lying. Am I? Use your magic to see for yourself. Njord cast a spell peered into the clouds and saw Tyr, the bravest of the Aesir, marching through Vanaheim, a great army behind him. Beside Tyr were his two generals, Hornir, Odin's youngest brother, and Balder, Odin's son. And striding through the ranks was the goddess Frigg, who had the power to heal any wound. Achark! cried Tyr, and his army charged into Njord's great stone hall, killing the guards and smashing down the walls. In no time, they had reduced the hall to rubble. Far off in Asgard, Njord felt the damage to his home deep in his bones. He turned to his son, Frey. Odin must pay for this insult, he hissed. Begin the attack on Asgard. I am ready, father, replied Frey. He raised his sword arm and with a blood-curdling cry, he and his army began to charge. Odin didn't move. With a gloating smile, he blasted on a trumpet, and his son, Thor, came storming into battle in a chariot pulled by two ferocious goats, Tooth Nasher and Tooth Grinder. Their hooves pounded so hard, great peals of thunder shook the Nine Realms. Thor swung a sword at Frey as he passed him, and Frey countered with a mighty clang. Frey knew he was no match for Thor in battle skills, but he didn't need to be. He had a secret weapon. A magic sword. Frey let go of the blade and backed away. His sword sprang to life and flew through the air as if controlled by an unseen hand. Thor jumped from his chariot and battled with the sword with his own, but it countered his every blow. Stop! Odin cried out. I call a truce. Let us not see our sons kill each other. I agree, said Njord. 
He nodded at Frey, who grabbed his magic sword in one hand, offering the other to Thor as a token of peace, and the two warriors shook hands. Now, call off your army, Njord said to Odin. They've already destroyed my home. It is done, Odin declared, pointing into the distance. Look, I have sent my ravens to tell Tyr to return to Asgard. And we will return to Vanaheim, said Njord. Or, Odin began, as a sign of our newfound peace, why don't you stay here in Asgard? and sit on the Aesir Council. I like the idea of being able to keep an eye on you, Njord mused. I agree, on one condition. You let us keep an Aesir god in Vanaheim. Gladly, said Odin. Take my brother, Honir. Honir? asked Njord. What good is that simpleton? My brother is no simpleton, Odin fumed. Why, there's no one better at considering advice. He'll make an excellent chairman for your council. But to help him, I'll send Mimir to Vanheim too. Mimir guards the Well of Truth. There's little he doesn't know. So be it, declared Njord, and the two kings shook hands. Njord built a new hall in Asgard, as did his son Frey and daughter Freya. The Aesir welcomed and accepted them. But in Vanaheim, the Vanir were soon cursing Odin's name. Honir refused to help the council make any decisions unless Mirmir told him what to say. And Mirmir was so angry at being sent to Vanaheim, he never spoke a word. The Vanir sliced off Mirmir's head and sent it to Odin, threatening to start a new war. But Odin did not take the bait. Instead, he covered the head with herbs so it would not rot, and sang charms over it to give it the power of speech, and thus revealing to him all mere mere secrets. When Njord saw Mirmir's head beside Odin's throne, he knew Odin had a great advantage over the Vanir. If war ever broke out again, he was sure the Aesir would win. He vowed to stay loyal to Odin from that day on, and always to keep the peace. And with that, my friends, I will take a little break from these stories. Refresh myself a little. Maybe take a walk by the lake, in the sun or under the moonlight. Spend some time in the forest and think on life, past present, and future. But you carry on your day and look forward to some more Norse mythology. If this is, of course, myth and legend, you may believe what you wish to believe. And next time we gather, I may just share some stories of Loki, the 
trickster. I hope you would like that. And there are many more tales. I won't be running out any time soon, don't you worry about that. I hope you enjoyed what you listened to today. If you did, please do leave me a comment. Show me a thumbs up of approval. And I will be back shortly. You take care. Stay foxy. And I'll... Read to you soon.